Hi, I'm Danny Ramos, and welcome to this week's edition of Hispanic Speak Out TV, brought to you every week on Bright House Cable, Channel 49, 9.30 p.m. We've been on the air for eight years now, and uh, Bright House has not kicked us off, which means that we're probably doing an adequate job for them and for us and for the community. Um, tonight, we have um, uh, two attorneys. Uh, that specialize in immigration. Now, you know the immigration issue is extremely hot with the presidential campaign coming up. Uh, the Republicans are even uh, taking a soft shoe on immigration. Gingrich uh, came up and said that we should reconsider our immigration policy. And of course, the Democrats are soft on immigration, as they always are. Um, and they're both fighting for the Hispanic vote uh, for the upcoming presidential campaign. And the immigration issue is a major Southwest issue in the United States. Um, so uh, a lot of Hispanics will be the deciding factor for some states. And of course, the I-4 corridor here in Central Florida has a major Hispanic population. Um, close to 600,000 people are Hispanic in Central Florida. And uh, some of the counties, like Orange County and, of course, Osceola County, are very dominant Hispanic. And um, we have here Spanish broadcasting uh, language with Univision and Telemundo. We have Spanish newspapers here. And uh, a lot of people um, um, that are in Central Florida uh, have immigration problems. So we decided to invite a couple of immigration specialists to talk about the do's and don'ts about immigration. And um, uh, our attorney to my, uh, to my side is Scott Seltzer. And he specializes in immigration and uh, also Camila uh, Pachon. Pachon, and she is Colombian? I am. And you were born in Colombia? I was born and raised. I moved to the United States in 2001. Okay. And uh, so you have a real handle on a picture of what's going on immigration from the Hispanic perspective. Uh, Scott, tell me a little bit about your practice and, and how you service the community and what services you provide. We've been here in Central Florida for approximately 15 years. We have focused almost exclusively during those 15 years on immigration. Uh, it, it's our theory, I think, of, of the world that diversity makes America great, and that's what has made America great. We have become a world leader because we attract the best and the brightest. We've become a world leader because we attract entrepreneurs. We have become a world leader because we attract good people who work hard to get the job done for their families. And that's what we try to promote in our practice, is getting those people here to do good things for the so family when, and ourselves. Do you service a community or a clientele that comes to you before they come here or after they come here or both? Um, and what's the difference in the approach? Well, generally most people get here on their own um, through either being a student or on a visitor visa. Every once in a while with someone with connections who knows someone who was here previously will get us in connection with that person. But generally they're already here and they're looking for a way to stay. Okay. What is the Obama immigration policy right now? And uh, what do you see, because I read in the paper, there's a big article on, on, in, um, in, um, on the front page of, of USA Today. Mm -hmm. okay? And it took two massive pages with a lot of full, big photos of this lady, Spanish lady, uh, that has the same common name I have, and Ramos is a common name. Uh, but she comes from Mexico, or she originally ori originated from Mexico. And it talks about her being here for over two decades, and her children were born here. So now she is working in Oregon, because most people don't look at Oregon as a Hispanic enclave. Right. They look at Miami, New York, or the Southwest. And um, after two decades, she decided to apply for residency, and all of a sudden, that put up a big red banner, here I am, and I'm here illegally, and they went to her job, handcuffed her, and deported her. Um, is that a common situation right now? It is a common situation. It is. There's thousands of stories like this lady. Um, it's good that it's now being brought to the front line so people can understand the type of people that are now being deported. Um, story like the lady, Miss Ramos, there's thousands throughout the United States, not only in Oregon, but throughout the nation. And what we need to understand is that stories like this one is separating United States citizen children from their immigrant parents. A lot of these families have chosen to let their children stay here because a lot of them don't even, they don't even know their, their country of origin or their parents' country of origin. They don't speak the language. And they, this is their home country. This is the only country that they have known. And of course, this country has better opportunities for them. So these families have to face the, the decision of whether 
we take the children back to our home country or we separate the family. And unfortunately, there's a lot of families who are now deciding to just leave their children behind. But this is creating an underclass and this is gonna have consequences in the long term that I believe that in the long term, we're gonna look back at this period of time and we're gonna regret a lot of the policies that are now taking place. Is, is the Republican policy different from the Democratic policy, or is it just a consistent immigration policy? Because in that story, um, particularly what shocked me was that um, President Obama um, said that he's going to do, he's going to relook at the immigration policy and focus in on on negative people, people that are here as criminals. And this particular lady didn't even have a parking ticket. Correct. And three guys show up, you know, and, and handcuff her. Mm -hmm. So those resources are put, being put on a person who has actually been very law-abiding, paying taxes, withholding taxes from her paycheck and all of that, and has three kids, one of which is working to help support the group. And um, they attacked her. Mm -hmm. Now, you have three guys who are law enforcement officers going to Oregon to arrest a lady who has been law-abiding. Why isn't that being used to investigate on the border and stop drug trafficking right. or, or the gun running? Well, that's a question that we all have. Um, the, the Obama administration announcement that was recently made, unfortunately, it was just an announcement. Just recently, there are some policies that have been taking place in which uh, immigration has decided that they're going to review the cases of people who are currently in deportation proceedings and supposedly they're going to give priority to the people who have a criminal record or, the, or they pose a risk to national security. However, this is, that was just an announcement. There is nothing set in place as of right now. Uh, there have been some other announcements whether they're going to start pilot programs in Oregon and I believe Baltimore. Um, but people also in the community need to understand that there is no law, no regulation in place. So if you hear somebody on the street saying, oh, because of the new announcement, I can get you a green card, I can get you a, a work permit, that is not true. There's a lot of scams out there, and people really need to understand that as of right now, there is no new law. That's one of the things that was quoted in the paper, that they quoted the uh, police, uh, the ICE officer, the ICE officer that arrested her, and she, and, and she said, I thought Obama uh, introduced um, regulation that, you know, it would be okay for me, you know? And he said, that's just, he was quoted as saying by people in the room when that happened uh, at her job, because they arrested her at her job, mm -hmm. um, that that's just politics, quote unquote. The statement was just politics. There is a, a large difference between theory and practice in this area. Unfortunately, the theory takes a long time to implement in a governmental agency. They now have two pilot programs that have started, Denver, as you said, and uh, Baltimore, where they're going to start exercising the discretion to perhaps terminate that type of case so that she's able to stay here with her family. They are, between now and January, they are training all of the attorneys, uh, ICE attorneys in the United States to implement that program. They have a list of 19 different reasons or, or considerations to take into account for each case and they can decide at that point whether they will terminate the case, call it as they say, administratively close the case, but basically take no action, no further action against that person and they are targeting the criminal aliens and people who have, they call them scoff laws, who have been here several times illegally in the United States and they are targeting those people to continue those cases. Had she uh, had that six months from now, she might still be here with her children. Why do you think this situation is going on? I mean, this whole immigration problem, why, why, what, why are we at, at talking about this, really? Well, I think there are two basic reasons for that. One is we haven't done anything about it for over 20, 30, 40 years. We've allowed people to come in here because it was good for them to come in here. They took jobs that other people didn't want to do. They provided jobs at lower wages. So we let people come in and they came in illegally because of the good jobs. We've done nothing. Um, and now all of a sudden we're going to turn around and say, we don't want you here anymore. That has hurt. And now add that to what I think is it's a political ideology. If you take the political ideology away from it, the mix and you concentrate on economic and humanitarian issues, I think the, the problem 
it's a, it's a difficult problem. It's not going to be solved overnight. But if you concentrate on those two issues, I think much of the problems will be eliminated. I think we'll be back. And it will be no coincidence when our immigration issues are vastly repaired that our economy will be back on track. And I think another issue is the economy, the economic crisis that we're going through. A lot of people are looking for scapegoats, the lack of jobs, who to blame the immigrants. They're taking over our jobs, jobs that Americans should be taking, which is not the case. If you look at the research, immigrants take jobs that nobody's willing to do. Um, here in Central Florida, there's a lot of farm jobs that are seasonal that they do. And I don't see anybody, you know, who's not Hispanic take working a field. I've been up there and I don't see anybody there willing to break their back for 12 hours a day in the summer, you know, and, and, and the fall picking stuff. So I think you're absolutely right. I think the political climate right now is uh, the issue has come to the surface. And if you look at it historically, um, the Bracero program going all the way back to the 1950s allowed immigrants, they were welcome to cross the border, they were encouraged to cross the border by the growers in the southeast United, southwest United States because it was cheap labor. Yes, absolutely. And they'd cross the border back and forth with no problem. Nobody would even question them. They'd walk right across because they knew that they were going, the trucks were going to uh, American farmers to provide labor for American farmers. That was good. The Bracero program was going on for, for decades. You know, it started in the 1940s right after World War II. And um, so at that time, it was very, very acceptable you know, to have to have that situation going. And I think that, you know, the terrorist thing, you know, fear of the closing of the borders, you know, because of terrorism, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, but what people don't realize is that um, Mexican, the Mexican community was very vital for the United States survival as a country during World War II. You know, it was, it was Mexican oil tankers that were delivering oil through the Gulf of Mexico during that period of time so that our factories and our and our warships would have oil. We were we were taking oil from Mexico, and uh, and the German uh, war machine was very interested, obviously, in getting Mexico as an ally. And Mexico was did remain neutral for a while, and then they had to make a decision because the pressure was coming from both sides on Mexi Mexico. The Germans wanted to go into Mexico because they could walk into the United States with with, with an army. You know, if, if, if they wanted to, and saboteurs were coming, would be easily to come over the Mexican border if Mexico cooperated with Germany. Mm -hmm. And most people don't realize that it wasn't a big air, air, uh, 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 air force, but the Mexican Air Force flew backing up the United States in the Pacific. You know, and it wasn't 10,000 planes, but it was a couple of hundred planes that went out and, and actually supported the U.S. effort. Also, Mexican workers manned U.S. war factories. They were making the shells. They were making the bullets. They were building tanks uh, during the war. Without, you know, it, it's, it's really, really uh, questionable whether the United States would not have been, uh, would have been invaded or not if it wasn't for Mexicans holding down that border to prevent the Germans from going into Mexico and then coming into the United States. So most Americans don't realize that Mexico provided you know, uh, a very, very clear support for the United States in surviving the war. And it's not, it hasn't, that has never been brought to the forefront. You know, Mexico is a tremendous ally of the United States. Mm -hmm. And even after the war, they provided labor for the United States. And for that to be looked at, you know, time is a capsule. You know, everybody always talks about politics being the 60-second TV spot, you know, and, and that's the memory Americans have, the 60-second. And I think it's about time that we start looking at this issue from a broader standpoint. Right. Um, and, and you guys are doing a job to help these people. What, are, what do you have? You have other groups that you help as well, don't you? Yes, we we uh, represent people from literally all over the world. Well, who were you? What what immigrants were coming in 15 years ago when you first opened <laughs> your office? I mean, I was I came to Florida 13 years ago, and I remember there was nothing in my neighborhood. You know, my neighborhood didn't even have a light on the corner, a traffic light. So, you know, you've been here for a long time watching the changes go on. Yeah, there's been significant changes over the last 15 years. It's been, it was always easier to get the PhD people, the engineers here. Uh, over the last few years, even that's becoming more difficult. And why is that? Because I think it's a backlash of 9-11. We are, we are being less of a, a inclusive and we're being more diversive, I think. And, and, and we are trying to 
um, contract what we are doing in the world. And I don't think that's going to work. And we're trying to put up the borders. I, I think in today's world with the terrorists and, and it, the technology, I think we do need to secure our borders. I think we do need to control who's coming. We need to know who's here and when they leave. And that's fine, but I think we need to allow people the opportunity that once they're here, to get the guest worker program, to become part of our society, to feel included in the United States. We haven't done that. We're way behind. The technology is way in advance. Our government laws no, have not kept We don't know who's here because the government hasn't made the effort to put together a program to define who's here. Exactly. Because they haven't created a program that, that makes it, everybody's paranoid. Well, I they, mean, the Congress is completely paranoid because they're afraid if they stand up for proper immigration law, they're going to get voted out. That's true. And the immigrants are totally, totally paranoid because they're afraid that they're going to get arrested and thrown That's true. out. So, you know, I think the Congress is acting, you know, totally, totally against the well-being of the United States right now. Oh, absolutely. I agree uh, with that. A few years ago, they did try to put into a uh, program that said, we're going to co control the exit and entry. They couldn't do it. They didn't have the technology to do it. They didn't have the manpower to do it. They just couldn't do it. Well, if you, how, many, how many illegal on his... How many illegal immigrants or undocumented people are there in the United States right now? They estimate now about 10 million. About 10 million. I've right. heard 12, you know, so. But the sad part is that most of these people are just living in the shadows. And now because of laws like the Arizona, Alabama laws, these people have nowhere, nobody in the community to rely on, not even the police nowadays, especially in these states where the police um, in the past, they were not allowed to enforce immigration law because that was federal law. In, in states like Arizona and Alabama, because of new laws, now they can stop you if they think you're illegal and you can become arrested. You can get arrested for that reason. Now, these communities are just petrified of calling the police if something happened to them because now they have to watch out for them applying immigration law. Domestic violence. The woman who calls on her husband gets arrested because she's here illegally. That makes a lot of sense from the point of view of her and the point of view of the cops. They're going to arrest her if she knows he's here illegally. There's no question about that. So she has to keep her mouth shut. So the police are going, okay, call. You know, they, they get in there and they take her. You know, yeah, it's, they're, it's, they're trying publicity to, to say that they won't do that. But that's not but true. But will you believe it, that? It, no, I believe it in certain states, and I don't believe it in other states. In Arizona, you know, uh, a tech, you know the southern border states that are real and that are conservative and, and for some reason have the paranoia of, of terrorism and what's going on, yeah, I believe that, the, you know, the, the, and it's, it's openly stated that the police will arrest, you know, and, and detain and, and deport. It's basically just racial profiling. What is happening in the states? I think I think that it, it's racial profiling. I think the population is of the United States is just it's a backlash to the economic situation and the insecurity that all Americans are feeling. So they got to put it on somebody, you know. And and I think they're putting it on whoever they can. And in in some sectors, it may be uh, undocumented people, you know. In other sectors, it may be you know, uh, communities that don't speak English, you know. Mm -hmm. We have communities here that are, that are Pakistani, they don't speak English, oh, they're the bad guys, you know what I mean? So, and now, you know, they're being targeted because of all this stuff that's going on with Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, we're, we're living in a backlash moment where, where everybody's pointing the finger, almost paranoid, like the 1950s when, when we had the communist thing going on, and anybody who pointed a finger and said it was a communist, you know, the person would be blacklisted. And history says that doesn't work. They excluded the Chinese, didn't work. They excluded the Irish, didn't work. They excluded the Japanese, put them in concentration camps, basically in America during World, yeah, War, during II. World War II. Didn't work. Yeah, yeah. And that's happening right now. Um, of course, you know, it, it, everybody looks at Hispanics and throws them in a melting pot. You know, all Hispanics fall into the pot because they speak a common language. But there are Hispanics here who are legal from the point that they're born. Puerto Ricans have been legal citizens of the United States since 1917. Right. So they're thrown into that pot. You know, I'm Puerto Rican, and I, but I look white and I got blue eyes. But I have people in my family that are very dark, you know, who are Puerto Rican who are dark. So everybody's being lumped into a common pot right now. So even the people that are here legally are being threatened by right. profiling, right. you know. Um, so it's, it's a big mess. What do you think the solution is? Well, that, that, that's, we need about three or four hours just to get that conversation started. But I think one of the things that would go a very long way, I think two things would be very important. One is the DREAM Act. 
Children who are brought here when they were young should have the opportunity to go to college and become residents here and become productive part of our society. That's one thing which I think is very good. The second one is we need a guest worker program. How do you enact the guest worker program? Um, uh, because guest worker programs are usually controlled at the border before people come in. Yes. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that if they're already here working, <laughs> you know? Right. And then, and, and if you call them, then all of a sudden everybody's wearing the sign, I'm here illegal. I'm here illegally, you know, so people don't trust government anymore. That, it, that used to be a Latin American thing, you know. People, Hispanics that would come here, they, you know, they come here and they're paranoid of people in uniform because, you know, in dictatorships in Latin America, you don't trust the government. Mm -hmm. Now people don't trust the government here. Americans don't even trust the government yeah. anymore here. So, you know, we're, we're dealing in a situation of paranoia, mass paranoia. Mm -hmm. Well, there would have to be some type of solution for the people who are already here. Um, we have Nobody, to, no politician has the guts to stand up and suggest it. But is, I think that it's going to have to happen eventually. We cannot keep going this way. George Bush stood up. Yeah. Newt Gingrich is standing up. John McCain stood well, up. Well, uh, Newt, Newt came out with, with a suggestion, you know, and he said it's unfair, you know, which surprised a lot of people it because did. it's a Republican and he's conservative. But, you know, he said, how can a, a, a party that es espouses mm -hmm. family values be against families that are, you know, different. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So he said he was going to catch a lot of flack for that, and he did catch a lot of he flack did. for that. He but did. it shows that the Republican well, Party is kind of coming around to the position where we need to do something. We can't just sit here and say, put up a fence at the border. I don't know. I, you know, the Republican Party, you know, and, and I'm an independent. I'm a registered independent. Mm -hmm. And I'm a registered independent because I see issues on the Democratic side that I like, and I see things on the Democratic Party that I don't like. And I see issues on the Republican side that I like, and I see some guys that are real jerks in the Republican Party that I think are really jerks. You know what I mean? So I, I go independent. I give up voting in the primary, but I go independent. Um, the reality is is that they're living in paranoia because they all wanted, you know, the mass, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, but it was, you know, the mass assassination of all these guys who got thrown out of office the last election. You know, the Congress changed drastically as a result. So it makes every politician paranoid. Every politician is paranoid and is trying to, you know, they're not coming out. They're not being vocal enough on, on issues that they should be. And that's a, that's a perfect example of what happened with the committee, the finance committee. You know, you got a bunch of guys to vote on saving the United States, and they can't, 12 guys can't get together in a room after three months on how to save the United States, you know, financially. I mean, we're that shows it's not a Republican or Democratic issue solely. You get George Bush on one hand and Ted Kennedy on the other hand put together, and they both agree to this will solve our immigration problem, and it's voted down. I don't see, you know, right now, you know, if do, do people, do undocumented people are, file federal taxes? Well, that's another issue. A lot of undocumented immigrants have fake social security numbers and they're paying taxes with those fake social security numbers. But, but, but nobody's complaining okay, about that. Okay, nobody's all that complaining money. about that, but the reality is by putting in a false number, you're, you're committing a crime. Not true? It's true. Okay, by so that's, the false that, that's one strike against them. You know? right. Now, the other thing is that they are paying federal taxes. Which helps, but the reality is, if you have 12 million people all paying federal taxes, that helps a whole lot. It you is know, helping. it helps the Social Security system. It's helping all the baby boomers who are now retiring. Absolutely, 10,000 a day. There are 10,000 baby boomers retiring every day. How are we going to pay for all of that? Well, we got 12 million people that can help out. Why don't, why don't we put them on, on on the payroll? You know what I mean? And there's also the belief in the community that. If you're here undocumented, but if you pay taxes, or if you own a house, or if you have American citizens, they're not going to deport you. That is That's not, not the true. case. That's not true. What happens to the property? If, if an undocumented person has a, a, a house under his name, and all of a sudden, handcuff time, you're out, what happens to his property? It, it, the United States gets it? The government? Well, no. What generally will happen is if they have someone here who can help them, they can get it sold probably at a very depressed price, maybe earn something off it, maybe not, or it goes into foreclosure. Can they keep that money? They can keep the money if they can get any out of it, yes. Yeah, okay. And, and what happens if they can't sell it, what, you know, and, and they get deported? Well, the house, if they don't make the payments, then it will then go into be foreclosure. foreclosure and, yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a no-win situation right now for, for people uh, in, in, that are facing this issue. Yeah. And how many people do you work with a year? Oh. Like, 
you laughed. <laughs> I don't know. Is that we a lot have, or no, little? No, we don't have a set number. It's thousands, and yeah. we have all types of cases, from deportation cases, from PhDs who are here on outstanding accomplishment visas and different guys. So it's 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 a wide variety of people, but we don't keep numbers. Mm -hmm. But it's thousands. It's yeah. thousands yes. of people, and it's been growing substantially every year. Uh, we, we've grown over 15 years. Of course, the economy hurts, but the, Im the but immigration growing, issue is And now is with this whole issue with the elections coming, you know, and, and, and well, there are more people hiding because they're more afraid. Mm -hmm. And so are you getting less of a play right now because people have gotten more paranoid? They're going more into the shadows? Well, they're going more into the shadows, but also there's a lot of people that are figuring out that now they have to do something about their situation because they cannot keep living like this. But unfortunately for many of these people, there is, as of right now, there is absolutely nothing that can be done. That's a shame. And there are so many people now, they come in and I'm say, I have to say, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. With the uh, advent of the Real ID Act and the basically national ID card, particularly here in Florida, driver's license, you can't get one. It's very difficult to get to a job. You can't, can't take the bus. You're afraid they might do a raid on the bus. It's very difficult for people without a driver's license. Plus, the economies are better. I can do better in China. I can do better in India. I can do better in Brazil. Why should I stay here and, and suffer through this? Mm -hmm. So people are leaving. You want to know something? I, I uh, went up to uh, New Jersey. Um, about four or five weeks ago. And I went to a town which we used, when I was in New Jersey, I was living in a town um, that was next to this town. And this town was like, got lost in the 1950s and 60s. I mean, you know, it, it was a small industrial town. And as the United States came out of the 1950s and 60s, it just died. It was one of these towns that just died with, you know, and, and I remember it very clearly. I would drive through it and I'd see factories all closed, you know. I went to that town uh, simply because my daughter is engaged to a guy who lives in that town. Mm -hmm. And the guy is not Hispanic, by the way. And um, that town is full of Hispanics. And that town is absolutely vibrant. Um, every shop is open and doing business. Um, homes, you know, you don't see empty homes anywhere. Or, you know, it, restaurants full of people. You know, and it's all Hispanic. Mm -hmm. An interesting thing that I saw, and, and a lot of those people that are in that town are undocumented. And the reason why I know is because I saw them standing on a street corner waiting for the truck to pick them up. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw about 12, 13 guys standing on a street corner, which is the daytime labor situation. Right, but a lot of them are legal. You know, and, and I saw the Spanish supermarkets opening up there. The Bravo chain has this huge state-of-the-art supermarket there. Mm -hmm. You know, and why? Because Bravo serves the Spanish community, and the Spanish community is rebuilt this town. I'm not mm -hmm. going to say the name of it, but they literally rebuilt this town to to a, a vibrant, economically sound, growing community. So, and and I think that's a perfect example of of revitalization that these people can bring to the United States is what you were saying before. Absolutely. You know, um, they were providing tremendous business to American chains, American chains, McDonald's, all these chains are in that town now. They weren't before. Right. And they're selling to these people and, and it's all, you know, money turning around into the economy and new jobs. And there is that conflict between the current immigration policies and now the growing Hispanic community. We're, we're a purchasing power. We're we're very affluent, and our our influence in the community is, is growing, not only in the purchasing power, like I said, but also as, as a voting group, and we're only going to keep growing. So I believe that one of the things that needs to be emphasized is that the Hispanic community and, or just the immigrant community needs to come together. We need to realize that we're just one community and that we if we unite, we're stronger. Well, maybe we should have some kind of a um, conference in Central Florida regarding immigration, one of the hotels, and bring all the leaders in, all the Hispanic yeah, leaders. What is your website? www.silzerlaw.com. Okay, and we're going to put that at the bottom of the screen so everybody can see it. And you have a phone number that people can? It's 407-206-1973. Okay, great. And of course, we're Hispanic Achievers, and our website is www.hispanicachievers.org. Don't forget to go down and get your Hispanic license plate. At the DMV, it looks like this. And all the proceeds from the Hispanic license plate go to nonprofit organizations throughout the state of Florida. Morgullo um, de Ser Hispano, get your Hispanic license plate on your car when your renewal comes up. 
And uh, also, uh, don't forget um, to tune in every Tuesday night, and we're here to talk about issues that are important to the Hispanic community and affect the lives of every Central Floridian. This is Danny Ramos from uh, Hispanic Achievers. Uh, thank you for tuning in tonight, and we'll see you next week.